Um, hands up, who here already runs Debian or Ubuntu or a related system on ARM? Whoa. Right, you guys probably know as much about this as I do then. That's good. <laughs> um, there's been a huge amount more discussion in the last couple of months on the old mailing list than in the last few years. I assume that, again, probably most of the people here have already been watching that. Would that be a fair assumption? Maybe not. Okay. Um, on... Okay, some, it's a start. Fine. Um, Hector, are you? Yeah. <laughs> You're turned off. Fine. Hello? Yay. Yeah. Hello. I, the, we have a Govi document at govi.debian.net. And uh, maybe. Right, I will unplug that. And see. I need to configure my. And you can you can edit while we are talking here. If you have any ideas or comments or whatever you you want to talk about, and then we have uh, an official track and unofficial track, and in the. In the official track, we have news because uh, we got uh, new new ARM machines hosted at ARM uh, place. When you say ARM place, do you mean ARM holdings? ARM holdings, yeah. Yeah, ARM in Cambridge, we've um, finally, we had quite a number of boards sat around. It took a while, but we now have them up and running. There are six identical Marvell machines. Um, so far, I think the plan is to have four of them as build demons and at least one as a porter box and one spare. Um, we could probably... Well, it's not a plan, it's already right. running, so... It's no longer a plan. They do have now four buildies running and one porter box. Abeldebian.org, so if you need a faster arm of porter box, it's available. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so it's not a plan anymore, it's reality. Four buildies and one border box. Uh, um, okay, the architecture is that they're on V5. And in fact, it's, yeah, okay, it's up there. In fact, just filling it in. So you want to take the mic over that side as well, just in case. Um, so we've suddenly got some reasonable hardware for doing builds on. It actually has enough memory to be able to link most of the current big C++ packages without hitting swap. This is a good win. Pass. We'll find out. <laughs> <laughs> I hope so. Um, I mean, they are reasonable boards. Um, one thing that's coming soon is we also hope there's a very good chance um, I'd say this unofficially, but I'm on video, so it's, it's a bit difficult. There's a very good chance we should have even faster, even newer hardware coming online um, sometime either by the end of this year, maybe early next year. Hopefully V7, yeah. Yay. Um, that's not official. It's not a done deal, but especially if you guys all give a nice rousing cheer, then I can go back to my management and say, look, people really want this stuff. Hooray! Yay. If, in theory, one wanted to contribute, for example, a Beagle board that one had to a ARM v7 build or port, how would one go about doing that, in theory? Beagle board is not... Get, get, get the mic, please. The big problem with Beagle board, and I've used, I have one myself, is there's just not enough RAM. Even with, and with USB-based drives, it's too slow. I am mm. building open office or in our large package can be measured in days or weeks versus something with 512 RAM can do it in about two days flat. Uh, I think 512 is the reasonable expectation for an uh, ARMv7 port uh, with the amount of memory because that hardware is coming available. There's the... Beagle uh, XM has that much. 
Uh, is that publicly released yet? I think so. There's an early spin, yeah. Oh, okay. So my information is slightly out of date. So Beagle XM would be acceptable. Yeah, absolutely. Now, of course, the Morvell boards that we have, these Ombi 5s, they have a gig and a half of RAM on board. I don't know if it's all currently in use. Um, I may have screwed up building the kernel for them, and they're only, they're only showing a gig. Um, obviously, that's some, it's something that we found over the last few years on build these, um, is memory is probably even more important than CPU. If you, t if you are going to build open office or Firefox or, or something similar, if you're trying to link and swap, you've lost. <laughs> and they have SATA as well, which is quite important. Absolutely, so they have SATA on board, time. yeah. And the problem with BeagleBoards is that they only have USB, which maxes at like 30 megabytes per second, which is quite sure. important. You need many of them if you want to do that. This is the Tegra that has SATA. Uh, which boards have SATA? The Marvell boards we have at the moment. Which Marvell boards? Um, they're one of the dev boards. I uh, can't tell you off the top of my head. Okay, because... Yes. Okay, yeah. Okay, because there's some boards that shall go nameless that have the SATA uh, adapter sitting on the USB bus, which causes yeah. very <coughs> interesting LANCY issues. Mm. Um, this, this are the Ubuntu build disks. We're not using any more build disks. No, this is where the Ubuntu build disks, the kernel has been set up. Oh! I yes. see that hardware one somewhere useful. <laughs> um, <laughs> the other thing we probably should need to take account, um, I get maybe getting a little ahead of ourselves for the. So we need to decide um, how we're going to handle devices that can't handle the installer. Specifically, uh, I know this is true for some of the new OMAP stuff coming out. I'm not sure if it's true for the XM, but most of these boards have a single SD slot, and that is their input-output. We solved this problem in Ubuntu by implementing pre-installed images, which is basically what, exactly what it says in the tin. But Debian installer is borderline useless, and uh, parted is even useless because of the special partitioning required by the Beagle board. Because parted was written in an era where CHS partitioning was already obsolete. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you could fix uh, parted probably to, yeah. to, be, to be able to handle MTD devices. And it's been somewhat fixed. I mean, that's partly been done uh, last year. Um, and that's something that needs um, Pushing well, in, course, so, yeah. so Debian um, installer actually works. But absolutely. my understanding is that we've done most of the base. Yeah, work. after Biff did did some work specifically for doing MTD based. To my knowledge, the XM doesn't have NAND anymore. That went away. Oh, it's just totally SD. Totally SD in a USB port. Whoa. Yeah, that's um, uh, not sure how much I can say, but that seems to be the standard on quite a few boards. So mm. I think we may actually need to come to the possibility that Debian installer is not going to be useful anymore for these type of boards, and may, we may need a new type of image. I mean, the, even the NetBoot installer can't be directly used right now due to the requirements of partitioning that parted. Ooh, okay, someone wants to say something. Why can't we install to SD? Yeah, surely uh, we can. Generally, because Debian installer has an issue of installing over itself. Uh, that could be fixed. The second problem is that parted Blows it can't be used on these devices because of the partitioning scheme, at least on OMAP. Okay, so, so we need to teach Parted how, how to do these. There's, that's not in, in, insurmountable, surely. Yeah, there's certain architectural issues yeah. of Parted that makes this difficult, but yeah, it could be fixed. Okay, I think Otavio had something. Uh, well, uh, from Parted side, uh, Ayn and Colin are going to, to add the patch the patch that has been worked for MED support, so it sh should be fixed soon for part of itself, and after that installer should come with it. Cool. Great. Well, could you note there some somebody that the Debian installer issue, so we can. Uh, Gabi won't let me sign in, so someone else can do yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah, Loic's doing it. Thank you. Then this is the official army helper. I think we have the build IDs ready. We have uh, porter boxes. We might need to work on Debian installer to provide ways to install more, more devices and be able to handle external kernels because there is also a lot of kernels that don't go into mainline. So maybe in Debian, we, would, we don't want to support those kernels, but maybe we should uh, have a way to easily, yeah. 
one of the things we inherited in Ubuntu when we bootstrapped our ARM port was essentially every board has to be whitelisted in Flash kernel and libdebian installer. And what's currently being implemented in Ubuntu and I'm planning to push back into Debian, although it may not land until squeeze releases because I didn't anticipate the freeze to happen, um, is we implemented generic uh, sub-architecture support. Basically, if the board can boot with a stock kernel, it will work without us having to uh, explicitly whitelist, and there's a blueprint for its design. Uh, this probably won't land until Debian, uh, until SID is usable for general uploads again, but it will help resolve a lot of our issues because it also defines a mechanism where we can essentially add a new sub-arch on the fly if necessary. Um, that part's not completely baked yet, but I'd be glad to throw it onto Debian Arm and let people smack, play, uh, hit the spec hard enough. Okay. So that sub-architecture is within the kernel configuration is basically what you're talking about there. Um, well, okay, getting to DI guts, which I didn't want to do. Essentially, um, what the installer currently does is it looks for a specific sub-architecture by looking at proc CPU info and seeing that board exists in its whitelist. Mm -hmm. And if it doesn't, it does RMEL unknown. And there's no code to actually properly handle no kernel and no flash kernel, so the installer actually will error out after a while. Something I'd like to fix, but never been high on my radar. What we did in Ubuntu is if the, there's no entry in the whitelist, it froze up a big scary warning and then continues it looks at the kernel version string and tries to pull the subarch out of there because if a kernel is built correctly in both Debian and Ubuntu, it will be version number hyphen subarchitecture. So we figure it's a relatively safe assumption that if we can boot a kernel with a subarch flag, it is that subarch. I mean, granted, a user could break that pretty badly. Um, we also implement most ARM architecture we's, we've done, both, this is true for OMAP3. Dove and OMAP 4s, we've implemented a generic boot mechanism, so it will work across multiple boards. So you could swap out the custom kernel, uh, sorry, you could swap in a custom kernel and flash kernel will still do the right thing. And then you just have to swap out the installed binary. There's still some places where this needs to be fixed, but as we're also getting dev tree support coming from Lenaro, this situation is getting less and less painful, but still have to deal with it for what now. So that's actually a good point um, to dive in. I'm hoping that most of the people here have heard of Lenaro. Anyone not heard of Lenaro? I've heard of it, but I'd like Wait for the mic. Yeah. Well, in fact, I'm not going to give a description. I'm going to hand over to Wookie. All right. Um, <laughs> okay. To, to so give people a bit more information. Um, Linaro is uh, a project to make all this stuff that's a bit of a problem in ARM work better, essentially. So there's better support for uh, current CPUs, better support for different flavors, whether you've got VFP or not, and Neon processors, better support in the tool chain for all this fancy shit. And um, uh, so at the moment, at least, most of that work is operating at relatively low level tool chains, kernels, getting more, an awful lot of uh, kernel support which exists in various manufacturers trees but isn't mainline properly and try and make that situation much less broken so that's all good uh, there's also going to be work on things like all the new graphics GPU chips but they're all non-free so that's going to be a right pain in the ass um, but at least OpenGL ES and the graphics stack and all that stuff should work better because we're all getting shiny fancy fast displays with our shiny new socks which is obviously interesting mm -hmm. So, uh, yes, there's a great deal of stuff going there. They're spending serious money, which is quite good, um, you know, employing me and him and you know, so on. <laughs> um, several people in this room. Um, so, yeah, that's basically that. And we can use quite a lot of that stuff. Now, exactly how we're going to use it is one of the things I guess we want to try and work out uh, today. I think that's yeah. all. Yeah. To, uh, any, any questions about that? Yes. Okay. Keep that mic. Yeah, Wookie, keep holding. Okay. Keep the mic. I do. I have a couple specific questions. Um, traditionally, it seems like there's a lot of uh, interesting companies doing support. Uh, one of them, maybe Code Sorcery, they seem to be doing a great deal in, in GCC. Um, will that stuff become free software? Code Sorcery 
it is already. It is already free software. Okay. So, yeah. Code Source 3 releases twice a year, but what they release is completely open source um, in terms of toolchain. They have proprietary software as well, but um, what's in the toolchain is free software, and they also work with Linaro. There are, um, I think, three, four, four Code Source 3 engineers working on Linaro right now, about to be five. Um, and it's about two thirds of the toolchain working group um, in Linaro, which delivers toolchain, and we integrated their toolchain tree into the Linaro toolchain tree so that it's permanently public because their tree was not public until then, only their tarball releases. And Linaro is aimed at doing a, a release every month of the toolchain so that you get more continuous integration and, and yeah. better stuff. I think he was trying, Linaro is up already free software and, and the cold sorcery, but I think you mean that is this going to be integrated into Debian bits? Probably. I do mean that as well, yeah. Oh, so that's a completely different question. Yeah. So in, um, we integrated the Linaro toolchain in the Ubuntu uh, GCC because mm -hmm. it was discussed at UDS and there was a desire to, to have it. Um, and, and because Linaro bases a lot on, on Ubuntu. But uh, I know that the toolchain is also being used for the Harm Outflow port, which is the, the next point on the agenda. Um, it's been used because um, it's the only toolchain which was supported. Um, and, and I mean, we actually intend to support supporters in fixing bugs in the toolchain uh, whenever there are toolchain bugs. Um, and at the same time, it's the only one which also supported our Float ABI uh, right now. So um, we, we intend to support Debian ARM um, Float port for that, but um, I think uh, Matthias wasn't sure he wanted to use the Linaro toolchain on all architectures. If, if there's a desire to use it on some Debian architectures, um, I don't think it's very complex technically. It just makes it harder to um, forward issues upstream. You have to forward them to Linaro instead. Um, so perhaps that's a question for Matthias. Perhaps do you want to uh, do you want to express your opinion on the uh, Linaro diff in, in, in Debian and uh, why it should be included or not? <coughs> or I can proxy for you if you prefer, because <laughs> we've had this conversation. <laughs> so Matthias's comments to me were that um, the the Linaro toolchain is is great and happy and the most awesome software ever. But uh, as far as <laughs> its use in Debian, um, that's, that's pretty much a decision for the ARM uh, porters to make who are people in this room. So if, if, uh, if there's a thought that the Linaro GCC uh, provides benefit to the Debian ARM port, um, the, the impetus for that needs to come from other people in this room and uh, not, not the toolchain side of things. That's, that's not something that Linaro or the Debian toolchain maintainer any of us are interested in, in forcing uh, Debian ARM to use. Hi, uh, this is Tom Marble. I just wanted to let you guys know that I'm on uh, the OpenJDK IRC chatting with uh, Rob Savoy and Andrew Haley, and they say hi. Um, Hello. We'll hi. Let you... <laughs> okay, I'll tell them hi back. Um, Rob is saying that he was trying to get um, I see the bill on uh, a BeagleBoard XM, but he had some kernel troubles and he had to drop back to the C4, which is, I guess, the general uh, Beagle board. Um, also said that uh, there is another board, the IE GSV2, which uh, apparently has some good support. So I just thought I'd share those comments. Cool. Um, I guess the question really on tool chains is, do we think there's breakage in the other architectures uh, if we start using all the stuff in the, the uh, the uh, Lenaro toolchain. You know, are we going to break anything elsewhere in Debian? Uh, that's the big question. Do we have the faintest idea, or do we just have to try it? Well, um, I um, have supervised a lot of the rebuilds that have happened since the Lenaro toolchain went live in Ubuntu. Um, it's generally helped pre uh, across the board fairly well. We had a couple of rough spots right when it initially landed, but those got fixed relatively quick. Um, basically, we were getting, I think it was an ice when the kernel was building, but other than that, we didn't have any major issues. Um, on the flip side, while the Lenaro tool chain source has, you know, support for all architectures GCC does, I don't think anyone's ever tried to build it for anything short of ARM and I3A6. So, uh, no doubt we've probably got some bugs working out there. It may be a good idea. I, I personally think that if it's feasible, we should move to the Lenaro tool chain. I find it's better maintained. Then, well, I should say better maintained. I should say it's got a faster turnaround time for fixes, uh, and it's also resolved a lot of in archive ICE, uh, internal compiler errors. So I think it may be prudent that if we 
bootstrap the compiler for several architectures that are fast, probably i386, AMD64, ARM, um, PowerPC. Anyone else want to throw an architecture at me? Spark, I, Itanium. Build. <laughs> um, non-dead architectures and just do an archive rebuild and see if the end result is usable. I figure that's the only way we're going to actually know if we're going to stress test this architecture. For architectures that are not fast enough for an archive rebuild, I think we'll have to talk to the reporters in advance and see what we can do. See what we can do. But if we can get it working on six architectures and the six I named could probably rebuild uh, stable or a uh, snapshot of unstable in probably about, I don't know, a week, two weeks. That would give us a good basis to go off, and it's not particularly difficult to rebuild the Debian archive of a new tool chain. Mm. Uh, I know we've done it with Ubuntu. Uh, we could probably reuse the same infrastructure, and I know there's specialized tools to do it. Yeah. I know Martin's been through trying with GCC snapshots at various points. Um, any comments? No. So some, some comments about uh, the uh, different uh, GCC versions. Uh, currently, we have three, uh, well, branches of GCC. That's the FSF branch, the, the upstream branch. We do have the uh, code sorcery branch and uh, the Linaro branch. And uh, at the moment, the Linaro branch and the uh, code sorcery branch don't differ that much for 4.4, but that will change for uh, 4.5. So um, Linaro is not identical to uh, Code Sorcery, and uh, for 4.5, um, I assume we only will have uh, IX86 and ARM changes uh, in the Linaro branch, no other changes. Correct. So um, it's a bit difficult then to uh, use um, this kind of tool chain, which is only tested and only developed for ARM and I386 uh, and AMD64 for other architectures which are in Debian. So it, that's my concern. Um, I, which, well, well, I do not want to, to, to have uh, that kind of tool chain for all Debian architectures. Would it be possible? So now the, the question remains that um, um, we could use the Linaro tool chain on some architectures, but not on others. It's okay for me uh, to do that for, for one architecture like, like ARM, but I doubt it will benefit Debian to, to use the Linaro tool chain for, for Intel. Okay. Because um, that's the platform we use the most, and it's the reference uh, for our other ports. So having uh, something different than um, on any other port, maybe except uh, ARM, uh, I think it's, it's, it's not an option. Sure. Yeah, I think in long term, the best option would be to Linaro to concentrate in getting the changes to upstream GCC as fast as possible and Debian to keep using it. Whatever we're using for short term doesn't matter. We can use Linaro for the uh, hard float port, getting it booting, it, mm. booting it up, but on the other hand, it doesn't really need a much of discussion anyway. Yeah. Okay. My big concern with multiple tool chain pa uh, packages is this is quickly going to lead to the path to uh, madness, uh, especially if we are building different packages on different architectures. Plus, that's going to require adjusting some of the base dependencies to pull in the right tool chain, and it just gets very ugly very fast. Fast. Um, I, right now, we are committed for squeeze. We're not changing the tool chain. Uh, the closest that this is going, to, we're probably half a year to a year away before we'll be able to upload it. Before we'll be able to change tool chain. So, but it may be prudent to build, take GCC Linaro and throw it in experimental. So, if we have something, and then it's available there as a package. And for Debian ports, where I'm assuming we're going to be bootstrapping ARMFL, it can pull it straight out of experimental. Steve has something to say. Pet peeve of mine. Nothing that you're talking about would imply that GCC Linaro itself would be unreleasable, so it should go in unstable instead of having the overhead of trying to do stuff in experimental. Right. right. Okay, I guess move on from tool chains. Obviously, we can carry this discussion on afterwards. 
Um, okay. So there's been quite some discussion about exactly what um, ARM CPU features we should be supporting. I mean, God forbid, I remember being in the equivalent discussion to this three years ago, which was when we actually decided, yay, let's go for ARM EL. Let's go for, for V4T because that's, well, almost the future. Um, there's been um, some interesting discussions since, um, some private, some public. The V4T is a reasonable base target for lots and lots of software. It supports the vast majority of ARM hardware that's out there in the real world today. But of course, on the significantly newer hardware, it really, really is not optimal. Um, there is a, quite a lot more performance to be had by optimizing for the newer hardware. But of course, we then have the difficult decision of, well, who do we leave behind? Um, thoughts? Two thoughts. Um, first, while I definitely agree that the performance benefits from having a new port will be worthwhile, we need to t realize that quite a few uh, pro boards and processors have, shall we say, flaky implementations of some of their features. Uh, and this has hit us pretty hard before in Ubuntu on certain development boards, which have to remain nameless, of course. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, but then the vendor will rip my head off. And I like my head. <laughs> wait, 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 wait. Second point. Second point. Um, Second point is that I remember as being condition of the Army L port getting bootstrapped is that the ARM port had to go away eventually. Yes. Um, I think it's a bad idea if we get rid of the Army L port because there's still going to be ARM 5 devices entering the market and I don't oh. see that. No one at this point is suggesting that we throw away Army L or move it irre irrevocably forward too far yet. Um, there have been discussion about having a secondary unofficial port which may become official later but of course especially I mean we've only just commissioned a whole load of v5 build d's things like the guru plug the shiva plug are still I think v5t um, it would be a really really bad thing if you know especially after the discussions we've had this week about yay freedom board freedom box and oh what do you mean Debian doesn't support it anymore <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Also, just to get back on your FPU bug, uh, I think even the buildies which we have as Steve FPU bug, which is just a kernel patch. Yeah. Uh, no, they are not the same board. Um, they are older Marvels, and they don't have some 2 they're not V7. So, right. um, anyway, that's a kernel patch we can discuss later. Um, mm. What I find great about having two ports is that we can have different uh, requirements. So we can have a fast port and a, a slow port, which is more compatible. And uh, it's kind of similar to uh, i386 and MD64, where mm. Uh, you can run i386 on your on your AMD64, and it will support uh, very old VR CPUs or whatnot. But uh, modern laptops have all moved to 64-bit, um, and, and everybody mm -hmm. can run the fast port. And in the same way, I feel the um, um, market is um, kind of segmenting, and uh, there was always multiple options. But we get the the newer hardware, which is ARMv7, and it's more expensive, and very often comes with a uh, FPU when it's in a within an A-class CPU. Um, and then you have the, the cheaper RB5, which are going to be produced for a long, long time still to come because it, they are so cheap and they are produced in great masses. So it seems sensible to have kind of two ports like we have for i 6 and MD64. However, the side effects, uh, notably, it's not obvious that the current state of the tool chain gives us performance benefits on our art float. Um, however, the fact that we would move to, for instance, V7 or something like that uh, would give us some, a significant performance benefit. Um, and also, um, uh, I lost my train of thoughts because I, I've lost sight to the project of. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> oh well, we can we can discuss it afterwards. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, essentially, I'm, I'm happy if we have uh, two. Um, oh yes, yeah, the other thing is for ISVs, we, we try to produce binaries which target mm -hmm. ARM. Uh, it's going to be an issue if uh, there are two ARM ports widely uh, uh, popular and used in devices, and they don't exactly know for which one they they should build their code. So, I mean, is having two ports the best way to go? Uh, it seems uh, very likely that I, I don't think we can avoid. The, the fundamental thing is, I think, is, is VFP support is the, is the thing that we pretty much got to have. And then probably you might as well have ARM7 while you're at it. And then there's a difficult question of do we want to make it hard float or soft float and thereby keeping it compatible? I don't know whether that really matters or not. If it's a whole new architecture, I guess it doesn't really matter. 
So the question is merely, is it faster? Um, but uh, the other thing I think that's actually useful in the discussion is um, we need to work out what to do about uh, sub-architecture stuff. It would be nice if we could do some of this stuff without rebuilding the entire archive in a new way, you know, because it actually only applies to a relatively small subset of stuff for 90% of the things people want to do. Uh, and I guess uh, Steve has uh, opinions about that. So I think one of the things you said was actually precisely opposite of, of what you should have said. You, you said that if we're doing, okay, I'll stand up. <laughs> if, you're, if you're doing a new port anyway, then you can make it incompatible. I think if, we're, if we decide that hard float is the right thing to do, then it's a new port. If yeah. you don't need to do hard float, then you don't need to make it a new port and therefore shouldn't in order to not cause incompatibility. Absolutely. And so the, the real question of, of, of uh, do we make a new port or not is do we need to make a new port in order to get the, the FP benefits that people are looking for? It does, does hard float make enough of a difference and is that what people are after? That, that seems to depend on who you talk to. It does. So th there is another option which we didn't really name, but the concept of sub-architecture, so having a rebuild of RMEL faster with different uh, optimizations is another option, which is for which we don't have a name because we never did that in Debian, I think. The um, difficulty with doing that as a sub-architecture of RMEL is the fact that the calling convention is incompatible on, across an arbitrary set of libraries. Yeah. Sorry. Not, it's not completely. As long as it's safe soft flow. Well, exactly, no, but that's hard the problem. float is an incompatible calling no, convention. Yes, what, what, what I'm saying is that we have another option, which is to have a, an, another RMEL archive, which is built with high optimizations, like VFP, um, V3, and ARMv7, or something like that, just like, just like Ubuntu archive. And, and that option is something which we never did in Debian, but it might be the most sensible thing if we want to benefit from new architectures, but um, uh, without having incompatibility between ports. So. Uh, ISVs would decide whether they the optimize for to be supported on any device or whether they optimize to be to get the best performance and, and work only on ARMv7 and, and their packages would not be portable to all their devices but they would work on all new devices and they could produce a single package which targets whatever market they want to target. Um, Genesi, hello? Is this working? Yeah. yeah. Genesi has provided Debian developers with ARMv7 hardware They've donated 14 uh, boards for developers and, and five to six for a cluster for build demons. And uh, we, uh, Ma Constantinos Margaritis has already been working on the hard floating point and we already have like a bootstrap of the port, which is uh, it's running here in this device, which is this board. And, uh, it's, a, a, it's located at freebeck.org uh, slash repository. You have minimal tarball. You can play with it, uh, m make benchmarks, and just send, it, send them to the Debian ARM mailing list. And we're going, Genesi has also donated uh, two, two disks, which are two terabytes for Debian ports. So we are going to uh, install those those disks into Debian ports machine. Uh, Aurelian is go going to do it, but he couldn't be here today. And and then we'll start building Debian for hard float support. So it's just a matter of deciding if if we want to adopt that in Debian and maintain two ports officially, or or just keep our, keep with our RMEL mm. port. So a very useful thing for, I guess, for anybody here is if you have your own applications, which obviously you, you, you have currently running on RMEL, um, please try and get hold of one of these or grab somebody else who is and do some benchmarks with your, with your code. Because obviously the best benchmark is the real code. Yeah. If we can find out exactly how much of a performance improvement we might see, if it looks to be like you know, uh, uh, there's a 50% performance improvement or something, then... You know, I think the general feeling is probably we will go with this. If on average, however, it's more like 5%, really, it's not worth the effort. I, I plan to set up border boxes for uh, ARMHF so people, Debian developers, can play with this port and make their own tests and bench benchmarks. So please send, the, send results to Debian ARM mailing list 
And yeah. also it would be nice to compare, this is our, uh, Cortex A8, but yeah. Tegra board is Cortex A9. Exactly. The pipeline has changed and mm. it's, it, it, there's no real, there's, we don't know if it's real benefit or not of, of maintaining this port. Right, or so that, or that keep, keep with, with something similar what Ubuntu has now with this soft FP, which is compatible with, with current RML, and maybe we have other ways which we could uh, mix libraries and with HW caps uh, way or, I mean, this, this is uh, on the Gobi document, there, mm. there's a question about, about that, that how could we mix and support optimized libraries about that? So so yeah, as, as you said, there are two catches when you're testing that hard float port uh, with your applications. First, it's depending on your CPU, it might behave much faster or not. So Cortex-i8 is known to have mm -hmm. a slow VFP, I don't know, sure. register loading or something like that. So as a result, it will benefit of a huge speed up um, to use hard float, uh, which is probably not the same speed up as on A9 class or, or other ARM CPUs. So we have to be careful about that, that, it, um, that we are aware that it's only going to affect A8 CPUs, that the benefit is only on A8. And uh, the other thing is the current Debian airport is ARMv4T, so it's really mm. old. So you're going to see a huge increase anyway. Um, the question is whether there is a difference between soft float and hard float. That's, that I think, is a major question. Yeah. So how, how can we come to a conclusion on whether we want a port or not? Okay. Now, there might be some slight confusion here about soft float and soft FP and hard float. There's basically a way of using the FPU with still using the old soft float ABI. In this case, we move the FPU or the float arguments from the FPU registers to the general purpose registers when we make a function call. This way we can keep compatible with the soft float port. It is somewhat slower than having a native hard float ABI, in which case the arguments are just moved in the floating point registers. Now, of course, we've yeah. had su suggestions for doing, the opt for doing the optimization for newer stuff of doing just simple optimization on the libraries that people use. Say, like, we, at the moment, we have a libc-686 package. You know, we, we could go through and just have specific... Um, so, that, yeah, that, that doesn't scale. We tried that in, in Ubuntu, uh, and uh, it, yeah. it's only doable for a couple of libraries, but um, you have so many issues with that. First, you have to... You have the human time of actually changing the packages and making the builds slower and more complex. And then you actually have to make sure that these packages are pulled mm. at installation time so that an FD get install would actually pull you the, the VFP version or whatever. And then you have the problem of um, actually space this disk usage simply because mm -hmm. you might be using, you, you're only using the VFP version, but you still pay the price for the non VFP version or vice versa. So in any case, it's, um, it's usually not very nice unless. It's for something like FMPEG, which is going to be huge anyway, and it's on desktop systems, sure. something like that. But in general, it's not scalable. It's only uh, rare cases, probably less than 10 packages where we can do that. Okay. But I think the, I mean, the concept of having alternates that you could install, I think, is something we should consider. I think, if, yeah, exactly. I think, you know, th this problem is only going to get worse. We have a lot of options, and, you know, if you actually want to be able to supply what people want to use, uh, you know, we don't need every possible conceivable combination, but we need at least two, obviously, uh, and, you know, maybe more than that. Um, if people start producing things that have got neons but not FPs, VFPs, or, you know, there's a lot of things that have got VFP chip but not a neon chip, and so on. And everybody wants to do fancy graphics on their boards. All this stuff matters. Um, so I'm not entirely clear. I guess Steve might be the best person what exactly would be necessary to make it possible to have, you know, the equivalent of... Uh, uh, M player i686, but without saying that, we just have different M player flavors. And, uh, you know, part of the multi arch <laughs> support it, we've been working out gives you some of that capability, but we also need depackage mechanisms and, uh, you know, so on. Oh, so you, you don't like my idea of having the ARM EL libs package that's a 600 meg tarball that we upload every time we need to change it? Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, Maybe we can think of something better than that. <laughs> Multi-arch is something we've thought of that's better than that. But as far as the actual mechanics for what you're talking about, um, I th there's so much up in the air right now, I hesitate to go into much detail, honestly. Um, it, yeah. Once we get multi-arch in place, then we can start looking at uh, options for 
I guess, I guess the point is, we'd packages. like to move in this direction, but you know, there's quite a lot of infrastructural stuff, and you know, there's things that Lenaro might do for us, and there's things that Ubuntu might do, and uh, you know, uh, if we can all avoid running in opposite directions, which I think in practice is going to happen, because there's quite a lot of people here involved in all three of those things. So um, uh, hopefully that will all just kind of work. But it, in the meantime, we've basically got to have a new port, because that's all we can do. Right, so I think you, have, you make a very good point in the timeline of things. Uh, uh, we have to think about how much time it will, it will take us to implement something and at which point it will be usable. If it takes us three years before we can use um, server architectures, then it's not worth investing because we we'll probably move, we will have moved on to something else at that point. Uh, so multi-arch has taken a long time to be designed, but it's about to be rolled out, and I think the design is actually converging to an actual implementation now, and that's really good. Uh, Doing a hard load port is also something which we understand. I mean, we understand how to do a Debian port, and even if it's a very time-consuming process and a, a very heavy, and, and uh, I don't know, it consumes a lot of disk space, and it'll take more images, and it's going to be harder to release uh, with one more new port, but it's something which we know how to do. And um, I very much like the concept of server architectures, but nobody has a plan for them yet. So I question whether it's sensible to go in that direction um, if we don't have any idea of uh, how we want to implement them. Like, for instance, where they store in the pool, uh, how do you pull them on the, uh, on the system, uh, whether they are um, a, a complement to the existing packages or whether they are completely uh, uh, replacing packages. Um, so server architecture is a nice concept, but I, I think we, we are too far from uh, an actual design that um, it's reasonable to bait on that. Does someone have a design for server architecture? <laughs> The other problem with multi-arch, uh, especially with this, is we are going to need a unique triplex for this to work properly, and ideally, we need to change the first part, which there is support in upstream autoconf for actually doing. Um, the autoconf libraries essentially... Oh, we've done okay, it. I'm sorry. <laughs> I haven't had time to follow the mailing list discussion. Mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure we've got that big time. It's good. Yes. There was quite a, there was a, a little bit of bike shedding on the mailing list, and eventually people agreed on a route to go for it. Uh, there are two different discussions. One is a triplet for uh, hard float, uh, mm. which is one discussion, and I think that one is settled down that we're going to yes. use the same triplet, which is um, um, uh, weird. Um, <laughs> however, uh, on the multi arch side, we decided that GNU triplets were not suitable for using in pass names. And um, okay. this has been discussed over the last week at DevConf, and I, I think Steve is a better person to cover that part. Yeah, take a potato. <laughs> Man, you're not going to let me get any hacking done on this, are you? Um, <laughs> so, uh, very briefly, GNU triplets are not suitable because we figured out that they do the wrong thing for hard float um, in the sense that they do not accurately define a, a, a self-compatible set of, of ABIs, so they're not suitable for putting all of the libraries together in that directory because we may need to be able to co-install two different directories and it doesn't make sense to call one of them to be like an HW caps version of the other because it's not HW caps. It's, okay, it's not so an optimization thing, it's an ABI difference. So what are you going to use instead? Um, there is an action item to get the LSB to do it for us. <laughs> so, um, and actually, it's not just ARM that has an issue with triplets. We have a, a similar but slightly inverted problem on x86 in that we use i486-linux-gnu, and Ubuntu previously used i586-linux-gnu and has now moved to i686-linux-gnu, yeah. and all of these things should actually be the same path. Um, and since you know other distros outside of Debian and Ubuntu are going to look at i486 and say, well, what's that for anyway? Sure. Um, we need to have something that's actually persistent across time within each um, architecture family. And um, so, yeah, there needs to be an upstream standard we are going to float a proposal to the LSB as soon as I can get around to implementing a proof of concept tool to spit out the names. Um, cool. And uh, yeah, hopefully make some forward progress there. Uh, I guess a related point to this is, uh, as, as uh, Loic suggested, we could just build the same thing, call it ARMEL for different options, but um, we don't really have any mechanism to control that. Yeah, effectively, that's what we've got, Ubuntu. So RMEL is built to a different set of options, you know, a different, higher base, effectively, than, than Debian's. And 
The only problem with that is that people who randomly install things called Army L, um, and they don't a work. A certain amount of breakage might happen, and yeah. uh, you know that's where we're at already. Um, it would be sure. nice not to make that and, even and, worse. Anthem 2, of course, which hasn't actually been mentioned, but you know um, mm. that's a similar issue. Uh, yes, I'm not sure I have a point to make, but I guess it would be nice if we had a mechanism to control the, uh, uh, you know, the compatibility, the hardware capability options, basically, and we haven't quite got that done yet. Uh, but it's going to become urgent, I suspect, if people mm. are building lots of random repositories, all called RMEL, that in fact um, yeah, have different requirements. Does, uh, does everyone know what SAM2 is? Um, so in ARMv7... Do you know what SAM2 is? Okay. Okay, so explain. F <laughs> <laughs> that's SAM2. Um, so on ARMv7 CPUs, and even on all the CPUs, but um, on ARMv7 CPU you have a, um, an, a parallel set of instructions, which is 16 bits, I think, which is SAM2. And um, it allows having smaller code, which does the same thing as ARM code otherwise. And um, it's turned on by default in Ubuntu, and we've noticed that it would usually give better performance because you don't use as much CPU cache or memory, and so, or even disk space, and so it seems to be a good win to use some 2 by default. Um, that's only in ARMv7, but in ARMv5, uh, they also have some one mode, which is basically the same thing, but it has some drawbacks because it doesn't have as many instructions. But if we do an ARMv7 port, um, I think it would be a good idea to do it some too, um, un unless someone has compelling reasons not to. Yeah, and, and just to add even more confusion, of course, um, you can interwork, which is specifically you can have some functions in your code written using ARM instructions. You can have some of them written in thumb instructions, and you can happily switch from one to the other you know, on the fly. Um, this scares people trying to debug code. <laughs> I, mean, I think ARM's general belief is, having done this thumb implementation twice now, the second time around, they've worked out that fundamentally it's just better than ARM mode, and I think they'd quite like everybody to move to thumb two eventually. That's the way things are going to go. So um, I don't think there's any reason to fight that. We should probably just go with the flow. Uh, that's, that's the way things are headed. Yeah. And if anybody isn't aware, of course, when we say that the original current Debian ARM L port is ARM v4T, the T on the end means that that supported Thumb 1. Thumb 2 came in on later versions of the ARM architecture. But it uh, doesn't support Thumb 1, it's Correct, yeah. Uh, Constantinos from ISC is saying that uh, Quads is also implemented in the package, so maybe that could be used in, to solve this part of the puzzle. Quads, quads as opposed quads. to triplets. We only have triplet support. On for the names, but we have vendor tags, which is a quad. Yeah. So you, we could use this vendor yeah. tag for... That, that does indeed supply a halfway house solution to this problem for the time being, but I don't, I don't think we, we were convinced that it was a sufficient and complete solution. We should do this properly, uh, you know, and get agreement out in the real world from everybody so we could all agree on yeah. thing, rather than reusing the vendor tag in the fourth thing, which... You know, I, it could be made to work. It's, just, it's only a string. It doesn't matter exactly how it's done. But the point is that there's more than that. There's, there's the top level, and then there's a secondary level for compatibility. So there's actually two things here. Yes, so you, you have to roll back the discussion a bit. The reason why we were looking for a different triplet was to support multi-arch and also to distinguish in package builds. And um, the reason for that is that the toolchain was lacking defines for uh, hard float mode. But we fixed that, so we've sent uh, to the upstream toolchain, and, and in the general toolchain, you'll find now new defines, which are used to test for whether you're on, on hard float mode or soft float mode. Um, so that's one thing which is solved. And for multi arch, we decided to move out of the triplet. So there is not this requirement anymore that all the architectures might have different triplets. Okay. So we, we can use the same triplet for ARM high chef. Right. And looking at the watch, I mean, we're going to be running short of time very soon. So, quickly running through the rest, Efika. This, this is the Efika donations, donations done by Genesi. They gave us two Debian ports, gave us two terabyte hard disks, and some uh, major projects in Debian, or people already have uh, some of the Eficas yeah. to play with them. So and wonderful, they're being very generous. And, yeah, and please, they, everyone help me in, in thanking them. That's excellent are, stuff. Yes, well done, Genesi. It's really, really rather good. <laughs> they are also providing a 
build the cluster and provide the inboards to try to uh, get kernel into mainline and do mm. things properly, like everybody should do. Yeah. Um, and unless there's anything else, um, I'll leave it this highlighted. Wookie and I have brought with us. I hope Wookie's got, got his with him yeah, as well. I've given one away already. So you could give one away already. Unless someone thinks of a better reason so we can take it back. Um. Okay. Um, okay. We have a working um, NVIDIA Tegra dev board here right now um, given to me by one of the marketing guys at ARM as, as I left last week. It's currently running um, as a standard-ish Lucid install um, and there's instructions to go with it. Obviously, if people want to put Debian on it, if what people want to go and do other weird stuff with it, it's entirely up to them. Um, does anybody have, a, have, a, have an argument why they should have a Tegra board? It's got a Firewire port? It has... It's got LVDS, HDMI, VGA... Um, Lots of uh, USB. Da, 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 yeah. SD. USB, Ethernet, audio, um, MMC, some other weird connector. I haven't worked out what it is yet. Uh, yeah. PCI Express, it looks like. Um, so, and multiple point, uh, the NVIDIA GPU thing, so it can do super duper high speed fancy. Sorry? Yeah. It, it is quite cool hardware. And multiple point, it's Cortex A9 multi core thing. So, yes. uh, ARM's particular interest is people testing all the multi core stuff because mm -hmm. obviously multi core hardware is actually quite thin on the ground at the moment. Yeah. But, um, that I don't know. Um, if somebody would like to. No. <laughs> I'd really like to see Debian run on that. So okay. That would definitely be something. Uh, and the reason, I'll tell you why. Um, I'm helping out the Geneva Alliance. It's Alliance of Automotive uh, OEMs, original equipment manufacturers, mm -hmm. as well as silicon vendors, Freescale, et cetera. Yeah. And certainly Tegra is going to be considered. So you know, if Debian can run on that and other free software can run on that, I think the Automotive Alliance would certainly consider that for their uh, net next generation of head units. Okay. Paul? I read on uh, Planet Gen 2 that the Gen 2 people are working on supporting this uh, NVIDIA Tegra mm -hmm. thing. Yes. Yeah. I guess one thing that occurred to me that I, I didn't say earlier is uh, about Lenaro is uh, it's, it's a big change for ARM in terms of actually doing things in the open. They really have been resistant to that over the last few years. They haven't given us um, there has been help behind the scenes. There are people in there doing, you know, uh, Richard Earnshaw's been doing GCC for a long time. And, you know, but technically he was doing that in his spare time. And uh, you know, I, I guess this is a major improvement in terms of how much stuff is mm. actually going to get done and how much easier our lives yeah. collectively should get. So, yeah. um, Literally in the last couple of years, ARM has got free software major style. I mean, from board level down, there is buy-in. Um, as they realize that, okay, ARM is cool, of course, is a wonderful CPU architecture and whatever. The fact I work for them has nothing to do with me saying that. <laughs> um, but they realize that if they, you know, to carry on, especially as into more and more smartphones and higher end systems, they need to be able to show that there's actually, there's a proper software story. And so since, since that message started rattling around in, in the, in, inside ARM, We've now hired lots and lots of free software hackers um, to basically to make free software work better on ARM. Uh, there's lots of us now trying to do exactly that. If there's any things that people need help with, if there's any suggestions from people, then we're listening. They've been thoroughly infiltrated, <coughs> so this is all good. Um, with, a, with a bit of luck at some point soon, you know, I mean, those of us who are working on the inside might, might be able to fix you know, some of the longer standing problems. I mean, we're still running on exchange, for example, and <laughs> But you can't have everything immediately. But we are ho hopefully making a big difference already, and that's going to carry on. So, we could. Hi, uh, Marcos from IRC was said just hi, and that the um, ARM HF port has been added to debianports.org. Uh, or at least the support for it is there now. So the unofficial port is on the way. So yeah, I guess we should also congratulate Marcos for doing a particularly yes. fine job on that. It, yeah. it, it hasn't taken him very long. I wish we were all that good. Um, <laughs> so yeah, so basically it's now trivial to just try that out. So we can all mm -hmm. have a go at this, you know, how much does hard float matter and uh, what the hell are we going to do next? Yeah. But I guess we haven't got any FTP people here, have we? No. Uh, 
So I'm not quite sure how much resistance there is to having four more flavours of arm in the archive. <laughs> <laughs> as, there's no, as there's no one here, I suggest we declare it done and see what happens. Uh, that's the same conversation that ends with gunshot. Mm. So, I guess, any more questions or should we wrap up? Uh, just one note. Um, the TO2 boards, what was their intended purpose? Yeah, the, the TO boards was the previous release for uh, this hardware. I'm aware. The TO2 board neon bug is a bit unfortunate because it hard locks the board and it doesn't need root to trigger, um, which is, could be a potential denial service attack if we use them as porter boxes. So I'm not sure no. how... No, we don't use it as porter boxes. We use the TO3, but TO... TO Two are just build it is to build. Okay, to that, that's but not, fine. Not, not 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 for a Debian ports. I, I just want to make sure that those neon boards are not going someplace where someone uh, can accidentally or intentionally bring them down. Because they, just, they it, are only use, useful for building and stuff. And just wanted to throw that out there. That's cool. all I got. So just do not put it in the garbage. We could do something <laughs> useful. Yeah. Okay, I guess. Thank you all for coming. Thank you.